Welcome to the closing plenary session of this conference on possibilities and potential of global collaboration. I'd like to thank the team leads and parallel theme participants for their wonderful summaries that we are following. And I am Rosanna O'Reilly Runta, President and CEO of the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Et avec moi, j'ai deux personnes extraordinaires. Uh, Monsieur Jean-Éric Paquet, uh, Directeur Général pour la Recherche et l'Innovation pour la Commission Européenne, and Simon Kennedy, my Deputy Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development for Canada. Both are respected and extraordinarily experienced leaders. Uh, Mr. Kennedy has held six Deputy Minister appointments in Canada, including the Privy Council, Foreign Affairs, Industry, International Trade, Industry Science and Economic Development, and Health during the opioid crisis. Uh, he and Mr. Paquet share international education and are global scholars. Uh, Mr. Paquet has served in a number of portfolios, including transportation, international relations, um, innovation, radio navigation, policy coordination, as ambassador to Mauritania, director of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and for the Western Balkans. Um, both extraordinary people, and as this conference draws to a close, it's appropriate that we bring them together and continue and ask them how we can continue the engagement fostered by the wonderful conversation that we've held over this week. And we must move forward. And I'm going to ask them to start with their um, deep thoughts and their rose-colored glasses and tell us what they think are some of the potentials and possibilities for global collaboration as we look to the future. Mr. Kennedy. Um, thanks, Roseanne. Uh, it's great to, great to be here. Uh, Jean-Éric, it's great to see you as well. Um, just in terms of the potential for international science collaboration, I guess what I would say is that science has always been, in one form or another, uh, an international endeavor. Uh, whether it was a collaborative endeavor or whether it was the maybe um, you know haphazard exchange of ideas, no no one society and certainly no one country uh, has a monopoly on ideas. Uh, and if you if you look at the big problems uh, that we face as a global community. Uh, and, and the big questions that are out there, increasingly those are, those are global problems and those are global questions that need to be solved and they depend on scientific collaboration. I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, really brings that into focus. Uh, there's been a lot of you know, press coverage, for example, about vaccine competition and about the rise of nationalism and so on. But what we can't lose sight of is that you know the rapid development of vaccines, the tracking uh, of the virus around the world, this has been a triumphant time for international scientific collaboration. Uh, and certainly, you know, when I work with our scientists and when I sit with the policymakers in Canada from the health community, it's quite clear that we're depending very heavily on international scientific collaboration to track the emergence of new variants, to understand, you know, understand the epidemiology of this particular disease. And the development of, of, of therapies has, has also been an international endeavor. So, you know, we depend as societies on international scientific collaboration. Uh, and we can be very grateful that we have an international scientific community uh, that's been able to come together to very rapidly bring solutions to the forefront in confronting a, a challenge such as COVID-19. And, you know, we need the same kind of collaboration and there is the same kind of work going on in other areas such as tackling, you know, confronting the challenge of climate change uh, and adaptation to climate change and how to address uh, the technological problems and the societal problems arising from a change in climate. So uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's a time when international scientific collaboration is needed more than ever. Uh, and it's a time when I, I think we see actually uh, the possibilities of international scientific collaboration more than ever. So maybe, maybe I'll stop there and uh, give Jean-Eric a chance to, to weigh in. Thanks. Mr. Paquet. Thanks, thanks, thanks Simon. Um, thanks, Rosanne. Um, and uh, maybe just to say that I was also very impressed and pleased with the, with the discussions into action. And I think the agenda which is emerging from, from this week. And um, I hope that in our short discussion and in our interaction then uh, with the audience, we can allow to close it um, effectively so that we can then also use all that uh, energy and these ideas to, to bring the agenda 
forward together in, in this global context, as Simon very well, I think, put it. I, I don't think I have uh, anything to add uh, to, to what, he, what he set out. Um, what I, uh, from my perspective, could maybe um, say is that um, I think that um, research infrastructures are increasingly um, seeing themselves as very central actors of science. Uh, not just uh, uh, places where scientists come together and benefit from, in, in many cases, an absolutely amazing uh, scientific service, but, but full actors of um, science and research development. And in the context of the pandemic, I think this was particularly uh, powerful, uh, be it um, in the context of um, data sharing. Uh, you probably are aware that uh, EMBL, together with the Commission, created the COVID-19 uh, data platform fully open to the world. We had um, tens of thousands of sequences put there, uh, tens of thousands of scientists from all over the globe um, are coming to share their results and use results from others. And obviously also the results of, um, of, of scientific um, publications being shared on that platform. And this really uh, made EMBL a, a major actor with many other endeavors of, of, the, of the pandemic. Um, I think the pandemic, uh, Simon, I don't know if you would agree, also shows that um, indeed uh, uh, science collaboration allowed us to be so spectacularly fast in sequencing the genome and then uh, developing this uh, vaccine. Uh, I also, I think, I, I also observed that it has nevertheless, in, in some cases, and you mentioned vaccine nationalism, also brought us back uh, a little bit in, in, in national or regional context. So I think uh, that we really need to pay attention to that because um, uh, global co collaboration will be needed. And if I can take maybe one example uh, where I think we, we are now in a better place than we were six months ago, but more needs to be done, is in developing um, platforms for, for trials, therapeutics, vaccines. Uh, this was much too fragmented um, in the first months, uh, I mean, including because uh, this was done in absolute urgency. But these types of infrastructures, uh, networked infrastructures, uh, are going to be particularly powerful and important beyond obviously what is done by, by, by the industry. I think um, uh, public actors also here have a lot to do in the context of the pandemic. But there are many, many examples where we will, I hope, in the future, including as a follow-up to the conference, do more. And I'm sure then you'll come back to also climate change and sustainability, where I think more uh, will absolutely need to be done. So as, as we talk about science as the problem solver and we look ahead to the world, we're all looking at uh, the climate and what we can do for the environment. And I think that we've heard in the conference great goodwill to come together to solve other problems like the environment. But in our efforts to solve those problems, do we risk losing the individual discoveries, the um, the pure science for the joy of science that may someday be used to solve a problem, but not. And when we put all our resources towards a single problem, is that a necessarily a good thing? And how do we keep some kind of balance or is balance necessary? Well, I mean, Roseanne, if you allow me, Simon, to, to kick off, uh, I mean, Roseanne, I, I would love to see that we put all our resources in tackling climate change. Huh? Uh, this, unfortunately, is not yet the case, even if we are uh, today um, uh, in, in a different place than we were a few months ago. And, um, and uh, I hope very much that the developments, uh, the political develop uh, developments around climate change in the US, in China, uh, will indeed spur these much greater investments in deploying existing technologies, but indeed also uh, put the necessary resources to sustain the needed climate science and to um, develop the technologies and also to um, test these technologies with society as we move forward. So I would argue that um, we certainly will need to do more there. I don't think this will distract us um, or then from, from fundamental science and research where infrastructures play such a, a central role. Um, and just again, uh, COVID-19 uh, illustrates how, how this needs to be brought together and is being brought together the messenger RNA is very basic science. Uh, the, the founder of BioNTech, um, the key vaccine today, is today still, as we speak, um, a, a grantee of the European Research Council. So this is really disruptive basic research at its best. And it has immediately, spectacularly 
uh, brought these um, uh, these results um, and and will I I'm sure allow our societies to move move back to normal now in the foreseeable future. So th there will be no loss of um, of efforts done I expect globally on on this fundamental research and the same the same therefore goes also into the necessary investments um, in um, in infrastructure. And Rodan, to finish, maybe I, I think I can certainly count also on scientific communities to remind um, uh, my boss um, and to ministers of research uh, in, in member states, and I'm sure Simon is reminded every day as well, that there are many, many areas which require attention and fiscal resources. So Roseanne, I guess maybe what I would say is I feel like this debate uh, about you know, fundamental versus applied science or discovery science versus science that's maybe focused on big problems has been going on for a very long time. I'm not sure that there's an answer to it. I very much agree with Jean-Éric. I think, um, y you know, we can't necessarily say that, you know, scientific work on one, you know, big problem area might not yield all sorts of important insights that will be relevant to other problems that we face as a society. And I see, for example, like, you know, the Canadian government is, is providing a lot of support to uh, the development of artificial intelligence technologies and machine learning. We've seen in this, and we've seen in the pandemic that, uh, that AI has been extremely important for drug discovery uh, and for work in the development of new therapies. Uh, quantum, you know, quantum materials, quantum science is an area that the, 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 that the government in Canada has spent a lot of uh, time and energy supporting. Uh, there's, there are potentially significant applications uh, of quantum science to climate change. Uh, and so whether you're working on more fundamental research or whether you're working on, you know, whether you're maybe you're, you're thinking you're working on solving some of these big problems, I think there's a great deal of leakage and crossover between applied and fundamental science and science that's perhaps just kind of more discovery based and science that's maybe a bit more applied at looking at big problems. So, um, you know, I think, I think that in some respects, I think the debate's a little artificial. If, I, if we look at one of our biggest science facilities in Canada, the Triumph, uh, you know, the cyclotron in, 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 uh, in British Columbia, uh, that, was, that was built in the 1970s. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know it, it's focused on kind of fundamental uh, uh, physics, uh, but you know, it's had uh, significant discoveries and has done a lot to advance uh, work in medical isotopes, uh, work on quantum computing, uh, high, high temperature superconductors, uh, this kind of very, this, this, this large science facility uh, that's, that's really doing this kind of really amazing, you know, looking at big questions has actually led to a lot of applied outcomes. So uh, I tend to think that the, that the debate is a little artificial, personally. Okay, well, we have these wonderful big science uh, facilities, and um, I think that there are two things that we can consider with them. One is, can the facilities themselves contribute to um, the uh, good use of, of energy and be uh, contributors to um, a, a good climate of, of, the, of the world? And then the second one is, as we, we, we build them, and we live through pandemics and people can't travel. How much do crises like the pandemic slow this down? Um, or do they make us look for other ways uh, electronically where we can use the equipment? Mm -hmm. um, is there a good and a bad side or, or what? how do you do that? So well, well did, Jay, Jay, did you want to go no, first? Go ahead, because I'm going to precisely go ahead. Well, I get asked this question a lot, a lot, a lot, actually, Roseanne, and, and not necessarily just in the context of, of science or major science infrastructure, but just more generally, like how has the pandemic affected, affected my role as a, as a senior uh, civil servant in the government and the work that we do? And I, I often, I, I borrow that line uh, from A Tale of Two Cities, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. I think, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the, the cessation of international travel, you know, the necessity of social distancing, uh, a lot of the new realities we've had to adopt because of the pandemic, they've obviously put a crimp on ways that we used to engage and in our ability to do certain things. Uh, what I think is also interesting though, is the pandemic has, as I, as I mentioned at the outset of our conversation, the pandemic has, has actually accelerated new ways of working together and has revealed anew the importance of 
collaboration and the you know and and the huge contribution that science can bring to the table. So while I think yes, you know, it's more difficult, I suppose, to if you're in Canada to travel to CERN or to go to Paris for a meeting, but at the same time, we've actually seen in real time the huge contribution that international scientific collaboration can bring to the table. And what's interesting is we have technologies. I mean, this virtual conference is, is proof of that. The discussions that have taken place over the last number of days is proof of that. This conversation is proof that, you know, we have technologies and we have capability now to, to overcome some of the barriers that used to, that used to be there uh, and collaborate and, and can continue to work together. The other thing too, without wanting to get too philosophical, but it, it is in a crisis that, you know, that uh, the crisis kind of creates a pressure cooker environment uh, that brings people together. And we've certainly seen that, you know, I, if I think, for example, you know, Canada has been part of this uh, mechanical ventilator Milano initiative, which has brought together private sector partners and governments from Canada, Australia, Europe, you know, the US uh, to develop a ventilator model that's easy to produce, you know, off the shelf, something that can be made available uh, in, in, in countries with a, without a lot of, you know, health infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, we have our veto vaccine, the vaccine, International Vaccine Center uh, in uh, in Canada, uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, that's working with the WHO and a number of countries uh, on vaccine research. Uh, clinical trials are being run around the world, uh, but you know because you know you have to go to where the clinical trial environment uh, is most hospitable uh, in order to kind of advance the science. So, you know, COVID nineteen has been both. Uh, uh, a huge challenge for the for the global community. It has also been a, a huge demonstration of the power of international scientific collaboration. So, I think the question is there's there's kind of two sides to the question, and we won't really know I think for some time exactly what the shakeout uh, of this will be. But my prediction will be it will accelerate the understanding and it will accelerate uh, the, the kind of policy making that will facilitate these kinds of international collaborations. I think it just in the same way that it's potentially driven a bit of nationalism internationally on the necessity of having certain say production capacity in your own country and yeah. concerns about the vaccine supply chain, it's also underlined for scientists and for, and for the scientific community, the necessity of open data, the necessity of collaboration uh, and you know, and, and we see this now and with climate change, look at the way in which the pandemic, I would argue, has accelerated. Uh, it, you know, you might have thought with a pandemic that actually people would be so preoccupied that some of these other problems might might take a back seat. And then the exact opposite has happened. So I think, you know, it's just my own personal view. But uh, yes, we face these restrictions. But at the same time, we also have had a signature lesson on the value of working together. Yeah. And Simon, I completely agree. Uh, I, I think we, we we will we will on the contrary, we will on the contrary have more and more uh, closely knit together uh, teams uh, internationally, because that that can be done now in a much more straightforward way uh, in this hybrid and digital format. So that is going to be staying with us uh, over time. Uh, you, you alluded to open science. I think this is also one area. Where I think this will not be, it will not, it should not be possible. It will not be possible to go back uh, on on open access publications in particular. I mean, article peer reviewed articles were shared uh, immediately in open access uh, through, during the pandemic, and that I think has shown uh, that uh, even six months make a major difference, and uh, and we should make this available um, widely immediately. Um, I, I, I also think that uh, the pandemic has shown the value of the investments we did over time in these um, infrastructures. I mean, I spoke of EMBL, um, there are many other examples. Uh, I mean, of course, the very first phase of the pandemic has had some impact huh, as we were rearranging ourselves. I mean, in Arctic science, for example, we, we lost a season to, to a large extent. Um, and that, that, that is, that is no, no doubt the case. But as we move forward, I'm also um, uh, very, very optimistic. I saw few delays in the deployment of um, infrastructures uh, being built, the European Spaliation Source or ITER. Huh? Um, there are no delays which you can connect per se uh, to the pandemic. I think nevertheless, what we also need to be aware of and therefore deal with um, is that the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the nature of ideas coming together in, in, in a real physical environment, in a lab or in a conference, this we are losing a little bit. So I would argue that where the connections existed, the, the human team connections existed, 
bringing it forward and, in, and probably faster and, and in some cases better was absolutely what was happening. In areas where this was less closely knit, I think the pandemic has had more impact. So as we move into a hybrid new normal, I think this will certainly be taken into account. We've had two such inspiring, extraordinary speakers to uh, bring this conference to a close. I'm really sorry to um, actually say we're going to now have a question period. Et on peut répondre aux questions en anglais et en français. Yeah. Uh, mais je me sens tout à fait inspiré. Um, I am totally inspired by your words. And I think we are so fortunate to have wonderful scientists in the world and um, infrastructure that supports their work so ably and admirably and um, government leaders that believe in the work that everyone's doing. Well, we have seen so many examples of inspiring collaborations uh, in the, this conference. And I'm wondering, do you have any secret um, ideas that you can put forward for the ways that we can make them continue, uh, make those, make them carry on, keep that hopeful collaboration moving forward. Um, I know you talked about policy making and, um, and uh, access to facilities, but are there specific things that you can see us doing? Uh, Jean-Eric, I can go first if you like. Sure. Um, Maybe I would, maybe Roseanne, it's partly a function of my role as a policymaker. I'm not, I'm not a, a bench scientist. I'm, I, I, I run a government agency that has, you know, significant responsibilities for industrial policy and, and for science policy. But I would say like, if I look right now, and I would imagine this is exactly the same in capitals all over the world, this is a really important time for policymakers and for policymaking and particularly for science policymaking. Uh, we're thinking right now uh, about how best to move ahead uh, with investments that our government, the Canadian government, has made uh, in its last budget, which just came out, you know, six weeks ago, in uh, pandemic readiness and in biomanufacturing, for example. Uh, the, the Canadian government is, has made a, a very significant commitment to uh, support the country getting to net zero emissions, and is actually wants to accelerate emissions reductions and has set aside significant resources for that and has made commitments to uh, put in place regulatory mechanisms. And I think what we've seen during the pandemic, uh, you know, in particular with the development, uh, for example, of these vaccines, uh, you know, and, and, and new developments like messenger RNA, we have relied very extensively on the best scientific experts uh, from Canada you know, to give us advice, because a lot of that advice wasn't inside ministries like mine that had the responsibility. Uh, and we've relied on international collaboration, uh, very close work with our allies in Europe and elsewhere in the United States, uh, uh, you know, for things like, like monitoring of, you know, for variants and the emergence of variants, sharing of data, you know, clinical trial data, that sort of thing. So I think, you know, government policymakers, politicians and others have always understood that science is important. They've invested in science. But as I noted earlier, this pandemic has just underlined in a really uh, dramatic way the value and the necessity of having this kind of scientific input into decision making. And so we right now are thinking about what are the more permanent structures we need to put in place to make sure that science remains at the heart of the big decisions we make for the future. And those, those big decisions are gonna be made now and they're gonna be made over the next couple of years. It's a little bit like, you know, the rebuilding after the war with the Marshall Plan or, you know, you know the reconstruction after some devastation, you wanna, you know, wanna build back better and I think there is an acknowledgement that actually science has a, has a very big role to play in building back better. And, and actually, we need to find ways to get the scientific, scientific expertise to the table. And so, I mean, literally, and you, you would know this because we've actually had some exchanges on this, but we're, we're now trying to figure out, like, what, what's the, what are the advisory and decision-making bodies we need to establish to make sure science is driving our policies on a go-forward basis, both in terms of you know, future pandemic readiness and biomanufacturing and biosecurity, as well as decarbonization. So I think the world's got these big problems, if you like. You know, we've, we've now learned that we have another problem we haven't been paying enough attention to, which is pandemic readiness, and the world had to scramble. But as we rebuild institutions to be better ready for the problems that we are now acutely aware we face, and as we confront problems like climate change, I think there's this huge opportunity to double down on the contribution that science can make 
and on the voice of scientists and 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 kind of science to help set policy. But now is the time to do it. It's like you know the 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 souffle is starting to you know thicken. It's going to gel now. And if you wait, if we wait too long, we'll lose the opportunity. So I and I think that's the conversation we're having now. Zoe, do you want to add something? Uh, I think we do. We do need indeed to nurture this momentum. Uh, science um, has indeed uh, shaped uh, the response to the pandemic uh, in public policies. To begin with, uh, epidemiological uh, frameworks put in place uh, at great cost uh, across nations, um, uh, coordinated to a degree uh, internationally, certainly um, between uh, European nations. Uh, has was based on scientific advice, but then, of course, more important, uh, the solutions, the vaccine now, but therapies as well, and 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 testing capacities. This was all made available uh, through uh, accelerating uh, delivery of uh, scientific uh, research. Uh, so the, this needs to be nurtured because this doesn't go without saying. I think science um, has always been a strong feature. Um, in global cooperation, uh, but the attention, I would argue, uh, needs to be uh, greater um, in, in all geographical areas uh, around the world, certainly also uh, in Europe. But what I think is also a lesson to be learned from um, the responses to the pandemic and to the present momentum discussed during the conference is that uh, a lot of these solutions were also developed internationally. And so the case for international collaborations the case for having an open uh, science policy, which is uh, very much what uh, Europe uh, wants to uh, promote uh, with like-minded uh, uh, partners. Um, the uh, open science um, uh, efforts, which are ongoing, we, we, we discussed it, uh, but I think this is a particularly important uh, dimension, research data, curation and, and sharing, and of course, research results made available uh, uh, on day one. All these are features which have been instrumental in helping science provide impactful solutions during the pandemic and I need to inspire us um, as we move forward. Well, thank you for that. And there's a question that asks us um, how are around the world politicians receptive to the um, arguments presented in, at the conference to support research infrastructure, collaboration and open science. You just spoke about collaboration and open science, but for the infrastructures, we heard that they were good contributors to the economy, that they um, were the Way, place that uh, solutions were found to big problems. They were actually the places that brought together scientists so they could collaborate. So they were the enabling facilities. Do you think around the world politicians are supportive of that um, in these days? Well, um, to, 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 I mean, certainly today more than uh, a year and a half ago, uh, because of the demonstration now done by scientists. Uh, but I don't think that this is necessarily going to, to, to carry us uh, completely into the future. Um, uh, the cost of infrastructure development is in, in many cases uh, quite daunting, which is of course also why uh, there is uh, so much need to develop infrastructures globally in, in partnerships uh, uh, to share uh, the cost of development and then to ensure that they are used uh, uh, as much as possible by scientists, the best scientists uh, around the world. Uh, but that cost is indeed for, for national budgets uh, a serious uh, constraint and consideration. I think Simon is probably a better place than I am to, 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 to say how, how difficult it is to, to make a case on very, very uh, far future oriented investments, not only in time, uh, because developing uh, science infrastructures is a, a matter sometimes of decades. And when you look at, at CERN in Europe, uh, we, when we are looking at uh, the 100 uh, kilometer radius, which uh, CERN is now uh, preparing, we are speaking of the end of this century. So this goes uh, way beyond um, uh, any cycle of, uh, of a political and even human nature. And so that really requires, uh, I, I would say that uh, you don't consider only the infrastructure and argue the infrastructure on the basis of science itself. That is, I don't think, going to be enough. I think you need to um, make the case that the knowledge which comes from science, the solutions which come from science, technology in many cases, uh, are uh, what needs to, um, what will allow governments to deliver 
better policy frameworks, better investments, and therefore uh, provide solutions to the challenges of our society. So connecting the very basic fundamental research allowed by infrastructures uh, with the knowledge which is generated and the solutions and then the challenges uh, which politicians are confronted. Uh, reconciling the, 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 the time framework is, is the art, in fact, uh, of it. Um, and so this is not necessarily always straightforward, uh, but uh, many politicians are, are, are willing to do that. And again, the momentum uh, of, of today should be used to the maximum extent possible. Simon? Well, I I, uh, <laughs> I have a lot of sympathy for politicians. They have a very very tough job. I've worked I worked around politicians my whole professional career, and I, I know I know that the questioner wasn't suggesting it, but I think sometimes, you know, certainly in a democracy, you know, politicians can get you know get a bad name because you know we want them to focus on certain certain things that you think are strategic and how come they're not you know why are they you know how come they're not doing you know what we want and and i think it's it's just useful to remember the, and i and i and i tell this to my own staff and when i'm you know trying to discuss policies with my own government that i feel are the right policies i spend a lot of time thinking about you know how how do i help them explain the virtue of this to the public because if you think okay so we have a we have a westminster style of government in canada which means that any minister that i work for as a senior official that minister to get anything really big done you know the minister has to convince the cabinet and so you know and the cabinet may not have the direct immediate interest that, that my boss has they, they those ministers have other things they're worried about and and they may have their own priorities they want to pursue but it's a collective kind of form of government so the minister has to go and and has to have a compelling story for 20 other 20, 25 other people about why this is a great idea. And those people sitting around the cabinet table, uh, it isn't just a matter of convincing them, because even if they agree on policy grounds, it's a great idea. All of them have to get reelected every three or four years, and they have to go back to their constituency. And we're a far flung country in Canada. We're a big, we're, we're a big country. People live, you know, across four to five time zones. They have to go back to their hometown. And at the end of the day, they're going to have to explain why they made certain decisions and why their government took certain action. And so it's very hard to divorce the big investments and the big choices a government makes at the end of the day from whether those choices have public support, whether they resonate with the public, whether they're explainable or not. And I think that, you know, if I just, you know, come back to the pandemic, it's pretty hard to avoid just given, given you know, what we've all gone through. You know, this has been a terrible tragedy, a human tragedy on a global scale. It's also been a really, you know, just an unbelievable example of the power of science and the power of research to, to actually affect people in their individual lives and to solve real problems. And so there's a real opportunity in a sense. But and you can see that nobody there's you know, I doubt anybody anywhere in the world has got any problem with the government pouring vast amounts of money into vaccine research and to collaboration internationally and to high risk discovery based research you know to 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 kind of to deal with the pandemic because everybody understands what this means i think where it can become a little more challenging which isn't to say that these are not worthy endeavors we should pursue i think it can become a little more challenging if it's very large investment in very large facilities where the, for the average person on the street the benefits are very abstract and i have to say which i hope isn't heresy for the members of the conference but you know this issue of like basic science versus applied science is a real friction point i think in public policy because it's easier for elected officials you know frankly to be able to explain well we're investing in the science to achieve this outcome it's often a little harder to say well we're investing because you know we're not quite sure what we'll find but it'll be amazing <laughs> and that's okay if it's a small amount of money but if it's you know if it's 5 billion euros or if it's you know a billion dollars for something that looks like a big science project, you know, that, that, that can be a little harder to explain. So I think, you know, the key, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and which is why sometimes for these very large projects that span borders, to be honest, there's a public policy discussion about dividing up the industrial benefits. You know, if we're gonna contribute to this major project, there's a desire to make sure that it creates jobs and opportunity and it helps to advance science domestically because politicians, need to be able to say they're not just contributing to the common good this is actually going to have concrete benefits in this community it's going to create jobs and so on so i don't want to say it's not a matter of politicians being parochial it's the reality is certainly in a democracy they're accountable to the public 
they have to win the support of the public to pursue any policies. You know, we obviously pay them to take risks and to show leadership, but you know, that leadership and that risk taking can't be completely outside of the context of having some measure of public support for the policies they pursue. Otherwise, it's kind of like self-suicide. It's suicide. So, you know, and if you look at say, even even the moon launch, you know, and you know when they were going to when NASA was sending rockets to the moon in the 60s, it was a constituency who said, "Why are you doing this? We have huge problems in our own society. We have racism. We have riots. You know, we have the generation gap, Vietnam. Why are you going to the moon?" But there was a there was a people were inspired by the mission. It was like it captured the public ima ima imagination. So even though it was an investment, if you like, in fundamental science, it had broad public support. Everybody was glued to their TV set. I'm not sure that's the standard for every major science project, but we, you can't be indifferent in a way to what are the kinds of drivers and concerns that elected officials have to worry about when they're allocating funding to these projects. And that's not getting your hands dirty. That's not politicians not doing their job. That's actually how it works. And people like me and other scientists who you know wish to seek public support, we got to spend a bit of time thinking about that when we're making our pitch. We got to think about what our pitch is and how to make it as as attractive as possible, frankly. It's it's no different than any other public policy. It's got to get through the it's got to get through cabinet. It's got to enjoy some minimal level of support for the populace. Otherwise it's not going anywhere. I think Sean Eric has something to add to that. <laughs> no, no, I mean I must say I, I completely of course completely agree with Simon. And um, whilst I work slightly less directly with uh, with national politicians, um, I mean we, we of course interact with ministers um, uh, of uh, 27 EU member states, which are indeed. Uh, it's not that they're confronted with uh, w w with having to 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 go back into the electoral cycle. I mean, they are elected by the people and they are serving the people, huh? which is what we do as public servants as well, and which is what uh, scientists, which are uh, supported um, by public funding, are also doing. You are working, and I think that's also how you see yourselves. Huh? You're working for society, and uh, and therefore this is uh, absolutely essential. I think there are two dimensions. The one which Simon covered, a, a story which is intelligible uh, for for the broader public, but I would also argue that there's another dimension in, in which we need to invest much more. We did it a little bit during the pandemic. We are now trying to do it on a slightly larger scale in Europe around the missions which we want to launch um, in Horizon Europe. Uh, uh, maybe some of you are, are aware that we want to work on oceans, cities, soils, um, climate adaptation and cancer. In each of these areas, we, we are setting ourselves a very concrete objective, 100 European cities which are climate neutral by by 2030, and then we will uh, deploy research um, investments now in the next few years to provide the knowledge and solutions to achieve that objective. But that objective, of course, is not just research. And as we devised the, the objective and work on the plan to achieve it, we did that with citizens. And I would argue that um, if citizens are part of the design of uh, science policy, and it's done, I'm sure, uh, possibly also in Canada, it's done in, in, in several member states in the EU, they are part of choices made, including choices maybe made in labs. Huh? And, and if this is done on, on a regular basis and is, is also very public as an effort, I would argue that this, of course, also would increase the ownership of uh, the science and the necessary investment to sustain that science. So not just um, uh, citizen science or citizens communication, but a genuine effort to associate uh, citizens in a smart way to, de to design and to choices. Thank you for that. When uh, we talk about the pandemic, which we inevitably do these days, we talk about pandemic fatigue. The people are tired of being confined at home. They're tired of being afraid. Um, and they have great hope in science. But the, we also know that our first responders and the um, doctors and hospitals are tired. The teachers are tired. Um, and our scientists, we don't often think about that. They are tired too. They've been running their labs on 24 hour a day systems to try and get samples tested and to do all they can to support people. And now that fatigue, I think, uh, hits the world. And we all have hope that we're going to come out of this and it's going to be better and, and beautiful. But Everyone is tired, and as we come out of it, we notice that there are all the things that we let go, some of the cancer research, some of other things that we should have been pushing forward, um, that we have to make greater uh, progress on the environment. Um, 
But we also see subsequent pandemics like mental health and um, addictions. And uh, so how do we, when we face uh, an economy that's fragile and a population and researchers that are tired, how do we support that agenda that you have, Jean-Éric? And how do we pick what it is that we absolutely have to do first, second, and third, make priorities? I mean, I, I, I think um, the the issue of, of policy choices is, of course, a, a, a challenge. Which and 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 the, and the the right way to to prepare the ground for choices to then be made by by political institutions um, is is of course uh, uh, particularly acute uh, in these circumstances now. I mean, what I would say is indeed that that, that I think we need to acknowledge uh, that. Uh, uh, all professional categories have been deeply impacted by the pandemic. And uh, uh, we have uh, certainly seen um, the science communities adjust very remarkably. I mean, the very first few months of last year were, were more difficult, but uh, since then, uh, science has been able to, to, to really continue to deploy uh, its activities. And in, in the case of life sciences, uh, remarkably so for the pandemic. But I think we, we will now move out of the pandemic uh, around, uh, around the summer, uh, at least in many parts of the world, and then progressively, uh, hopefully, with also the big international effort uh, around COVAX to ensure that vaccination becomes universal progressively in the course of the year uh, across uh, the globe. We will move into a new normal. Um, which is going to be different from what uh, it was before the pandemic. We have now a new capacity uh, to work globally, as we discussed earlier on, to the, the outreach which uh, these uh, uh, sys digital systems uh, offer is, um, is absolutely remarkable, amazingly productive uh, and high, high impact. Uh, but at the same time, we will, of course, also have, again, the benefit of more creative interactions in a normal work environment. But I, I would argue that we need also to accept that um, we will need a few months uh, as, 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 as individuals, as teams, um, as institutions to find our bearings again. So uh, as far as my department is concerned, uh, of course, there is a lot which is happening, which will have to happen until the end of the year. But we will also, um, in the management team, pay particular attention to ensure that uh, we keep, we have a bit of breathing space for the teams to adjust to this um, to this new normal. And in that context, uh, we will argue um, that we need to ensure that we complete the pandemic response, that we absolutely focus on learning the lessons from the pandemic. We haven't had that large scale pandemic for a century. So now we will learn lessons. And um, uh, I, I would hope that we can also embed them in the institutional memories, uh, which was not done uh, in smaller scale pandemics over the last few decades so that we are effectively ready uh, for the future. And then we need to tackle climate and, um, and uh, biodiversity. Uh, there is no greater urgency for the planet uh, than to tackle um, climate change and uh, the erosion of biodiversity. This is uh, amazingly complex, uh, amazingly systemic, with uh, apparent uh, deep trade-offs, at least when you look at traditional economic uh, or public policies. So a major effort will be needed, but one which I think is also particularly uh, positive in mobilizing energies from uh, researchers. Uh, a lot of um, the squaring of the circle will be done by science, uh, not only because society also will need to change, but science will produce a, a, a lot of, um, of the solutions. And so the second priority is going to continue to invest in our green transformation in Europe, uh, as far as um, uh, the, 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 the center of gravity of the work of the Commission is concerned, but, but also in partnership with Canada and many others which have the same agenda. Uh, and that, I think, will be really what will drive and energize uh, teams as well. Um, Simon, do you want to add to that, or would you take the next question? Maybe just a couple of brief uh, words, Roseanne. So uh, I don't know whether I agree with the premise of the question, and it's not to be combative. Like, I honestly don't know whether I, I think you can look at this issue in, in a number of ways. So I'll be brief because I think we should get to other questions. But 
we do we do surveys of our employees um, to to get a sense of where they are. There, un, people are unquestionably tired. I mean, they're just exhausted. You can see it in the survey data, and you know we do surveys every six months or so. So that's but you know the other thing we see, and this is my language, but you can see coming out of the survey data, there's also a certain exhilaration. There's also like people feel like this is very important work. You know, this is I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you see you see contradictory results, which is people are very tired and people are also feeling like what they do really matters and they really it's you know and 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 it's important to show up at work and it's important to be doing this because it's helping fellow citizens, it's helping to save lives and keep people employed and keep people from going bankrupt and that sort of thing. So I think there may be, and I only say maybe because I, I, I want to have enough humility to, to not suggest my employees are just, you know, there isn't a real issue there. But if I look at my own universe, you know, what we need to make sure is that people, yes, everyone's tired, but are they spent? And that's the part that's a little unclear to me. And I think, you know, you can see after many other crises, you know, whether it was the Second World War or others, I mean, there's the possibility of a flowering of activity after a fairly horrendous experience. And so I'm not sure coming out of this, we're necessarily going to have a scientific community, a policy community that is just going to want to, you know, quit and move to the mountains. I mean, we could have the opposite, frankly, but I think people are going to need a rest. There may need to be a pause. We've been thinking a lot about how do we ensure people can take a breather because, you know, we're not out of this yet. But I'm not, I'm not sure I would agree with the premise that people are spent. I mean, I, you know, that it's possible, but it's just equally possible that 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 the trauma of the last year and the and the demands that have made have been made on science and the way in which science has kind of risen to the call and produced really miracles that might have an exil that, that actually might be energetic in some respects so I, I that would be my hope the second thing i would say would be i'm not again i i don't think we're going to know what the impact of this pandemic is on the way people think about problems and how they attack problems for some time my own feeling is that many of these challenges you've cited were there before the pandemic and the pandemic may have made them marginally worse but they were pretty terrible you know we had a really serious opioid addiction problem in north america well before the pandemic i spent several years working on it it was a pandemic of it uh, you know in its own terms that killed thousands of people a year and was getting progressively worse and the government was working on it but it didn't have broad you know it didn't it didn't have the kind of broad societal attention the way the pandemic did. I think what we've seen with the pandemic is that a lot of things we presumed previously were not thinkable. You know, vaccines take 10 years to develop. Okay, well, we develop vaccines in 10 months. You know, um, you know, we can't run a budget deficit that's, you know, 40% of GDP or whatever it is. Well, we had to do it because that was just what was required to make sure the economy didn't go into free fall. All kinds of truisms more or less over, you know, we can't close the border. The idea that we would shut down all air traffic and close the Canada-US border, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's just unthinkable. And it's just what had to be done, so it was done. And so I think for a whole generation of scientists, policy policymakers, young people, I do think one possible longer term lesson of the pandemic might be, why can't we solve that problem? Why can't we attack that differently? Well, you know, why is it acceptable that we will allow this issue to fester because there's not enough creativity to figure out how to deal with it? So. That would be my hope, but it's just to say, if I were to turn your question around, like how are we going to possibly, you know, crawl out of this thing in one piece, and you know, which which of the few things we should pick to focus on because we won't have the energy? I think there's a possibility that the opposite will happen, and I feel that the the way in which governments have continued to attack with gusto things like climate change and inequality and those sorts of things are a reflection of that. It's a realization that we have big problems. It's possible to attack, to attack and tackle big problems if we have the will to do it. You know, you know, creativity matters. And so, I mean, I, at least optimistically, I don't know that we'll be able to make a judgment on the, on the present moment for maybe 20 years, 30, 50 years. So that's just my nickel. That's, well, that's actually more than a nickel. That was very inspiring. It's worth a lot more than five cents. It's a, a wonderful thought. Um, during the conference, uh, we had people from the Global South uh, who uh, talked about the frustrations and that scientists there have not having access to uh, the same facilities and possibilities that, that we have in other parts of the world, and also the extraordinary needs, um, basic human needs that people in certain parts of the globe suffer. Um, 
how can we, um, coming out of this pandemic and using that great energy that you identified, Simon, uh, continue to address this problem and ameliorate the situation? Well, maybe Jean Eric, I could go first. I think this is a this is an urgent question. Um, I think, sorry, it's a bit stream of consciousness, Roseanne. I remember I I had seen on TV or I read somewhere it was some well known, you know, well known you know actor in from the global south. It was a politician or a scientist or something. But there was some they had been posed a question, you know what do you think about the reaction of the West or what do you think about the pandemic? And the, the, if, the, if, if in effect the answer was, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the specifics, but it was, you know, in a sense now you're, you know, you, you are having to confront, you know, the, the world that many people in, you know, in my, in my region live daily and have for a very long time, you know, like the, you know, death hovering at your door, you know, uncertainty about the future, you know, um, you know, like the, the, I, I think, one of the things I think that um, we have to acknowledge is that, you know, the tremendous privilege that we have, uh, certainly living in developed countries, uh, having access, as you noted, to resources and, and and scientific expertise and manufacturing facilities and those sorts of things. And I think governments, uh, I think there's there's kind of a dual challenge. I mean, it's a little bit like if a flood comes through your community, you know, understandably, your immediate your immediate thoughts are to your own family. You know, I'm responsible to my kids and, and my, you know, my, my spouse. And it's like, you know, you, you, you'd sort of, your immediate attention is you got to save yourself and your family. But of course, that doesn't mean you don't have profound concern for your neighbors and the rest of your community. And so I think, again, if I look at the scramble for vaccines, I mean, having been involved in democratic governance for a long time, governments are elected to serve their people. You know, they, they have expectations that the government is going to you know, look after their interests. It's not. It's not unreasonable that you know governments in Europe and North America and others have made you know have made heroic efforts to pro procure vaccines for their own people. That is the that is the basic expectation that the citizenry have, and at some level, it's not an unreasonable one. That doesn't mean that we don't also have obligations to the rest of the world. So I think you can have two things going on at once. I actually think you can have concern about the, the global situation and the inequity and you can also have governments that you know kind of in the first instance are really you know um focused on trying to you know trying to get their own people vaccinated so i actually have you know uh hope for um greater international you know collaboration um m you know more dose sharing vaccine sharing technology transfer i mean these are all things that are live and they're in discussion now i think there has been debate about Shouldn't this have all happened earlier? You know, how how is it that Canada can be so far ahead in the league tables? Um, we should feel privileged that we're so far ahead in the league tables. But I'm not sure for democratic governance, governments around the world, that the way things have unfolded, you know, that, you know, until, the, until you know, all countries have equal capability, I think you're, you're going to see democratic governments, you know, trying to trying to take care of their own citizenry. But I don't think that means that we're not also concerned about the global south and not also concerned about the inequities that are there and there's i think i think we'll see in the next few months frankly as for example as, as vaccinations in canada start to start to level off and that you know that, you know there, there has been a, a, a lot of um i think you're going to see a lot more you know attention shift in that direction but in the early months of a crisis i think understandably a lot of governments are immediately concerned for the welfare of their own citizenry sorry that's a bit rambly but no, that was fine, Jean-Éric. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I, sh I, sh I should go very much into the vaccines. Um, uh, I mean, except that I think there is the COVAX facility, which um, uh, is set up to, to allow a universal reach for vaccination. Of course, uh, Simon put uh, his finger on the issue. It was the, the limited availability of vaccines at the outset. So the COVAX facility is very well funded. Uh, but the uh, availability of uh, of vaccines to be then um, distributed was was limited. Having said so, uh, I mean there's a, there's one figure which is not well known now, huh? is that Europe has um, produced uh, massively vaccines in the in the first six months of this year. Half of those vaccines were exported out of the European Union. Huh? 
So only half of it stayed in the European Union. So we, we remained also for vaccine production and trade uh, very open. And admittedly, quite a bit of these vaccines went to developing countries also, uh, but not uh, not entirely. But this, this um, I think, now requires a, a genuine additional a global um, uh, effort um, uh, across the globe. But I think the question was also on, on science capacity and science infrastructure. Um, and I think, um, uh, I mean, the European Union works, of course, uh, very um, uh, closely with the African Union. Uh, we have also cooperation frameworks with other parts of the world. And science uh, increasingly uh, moves up the agenda of these, um, of these cooperations. And I, I must say this is extremely welcome. They are um, uh, science and research um, uh, excellence uh, in Africa. There's capacity in many African countries, but of course, much, much will need to be um, invested in this capacity building. And we will, um, uh, with others, uh, be available uh, to, 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 to help where, where we are asked to do that. But I think what would also be particularly impactful, and we are doing it as well, is to open um, uh, research infrastructures to scientists coming from regions which are, have not had the capacity to develop uh, these infrastructures. That's the logic of global cooperation around infrastructure development, as we, we, we said in our conversation, not just uh, sharing the cost of them, but then also having large universal access to these infrastructures based, of course, on, on scientific merit and excellence, but increasingly also open uh, to uh, scientists from areas of the world which don't yet have these infrastructures. And that's what we are doing uh, in Europe's infrastructure policy, I mean, particularly with Africa, but of course, also with many other regions around the world, and we should continue to do so. So two minutes each, um, do you have a challenge for the people who attended the conference and the heads of research infrastructures and a hope for them? And we got one in the question period, could we please predict, predict and prevent pandemics rather than treat, treat them like crises that they are right now? Um, so your hopes and challenges, uh, uh, Jean-Éric, uh, Simon? Simon, do you want to start? Do you, would you mind starting? Sure. So maybe to answer the question from the uh, from the floor first, uh, I I don't know uh, I don't know kind of what will come out of the the scientific work around pandemic preparedness, but I do think there is a there's certainly an interest and focus on are there, are are we going to be able to find ways to head these off before before they arrive? So better surveillance, you know, better better you know, development of therapies and, 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 and prophylactic type therapies to actually, you know, universal vaccines, these sorts of things. I'm, I'm not a science, bench scientist. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a scientist by training, so I can't give you a definitive answer. But I do know these are the sorts of things we're talking about with the scientific community. As we work on pandemic readiness, we don't just want to be able to pivot, you know, when there's a crisis and manufacture vaccines. Ideally, we want to be in a position to be trying to contain some of these crises before they, before they, before they arrive. And so that will be a feature, I think, of our of our policy work. It's an analogy that's not maybe great, but if you think of the way in which now security is embedded into the fabric of our international transport systems, for example, uh, you know, you can't fly from one end of the world to the other without, you know, providing your passport. You know, uh, you get screened. You know, your your data gets screened to see whether you're on a watch list. You go through a metal detector. Like it's just normal in a way that it wasn't in the 1960s, that if you're taking an international journey and you're on an airplane, you know, we, we know that there is a small number of bad actors out there and there's a system that just tries to weed that out and everybody accepts it and it's pretty seamless. And prior to the pandemic, big airports process millions of passengers a year. We may wind up with a similar system, but around disease surveillance and pandemic readiness, because we now have had a real lesson that a little microbe, you know, a little a little virus can like decimate the world economy pretty pretty easily. We sort of forgot that lesson that we did last time we had that lesson was 100 years ago. And the scientists say this will happen potentially with more frequency. So we will need systems a little bit like, you know, transport security to actually prevent hijacking. So rather than having the hijackers get on the plane and then overpower them, we want systems to prevent that from happening. So I think that's not a bad analogy. Let's my, give my, the last minute to Jean-Éric. Yeah, I will, I will now stop, sorry. Uh, Jean-Éric, there you go, over to you. No, no, well, Simon, it was really interesting. No, okay, I hope and the challenge will be the same. I think uh, what, 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 we, we, what we learned uh, fr from this pandemic is that we, we need to look at human health and uh, the health of the planet at the same time. 
uh, we can't distinguish the two, um, and this will increasingly be visible, I'm afraid, um, as we move forward, as long as we have not addressed uh, the loss in biodiversity particularly. Uh, so this One Health approach, I think, is a hope for the future uh, and a challenge for scientists to, to address um, uh, impactfully and, uh, and largely and urgently. So I, 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 and I think research infrastructures will play a key role in providing the knowledge to do that. On behalf of the people listening around the world, I applaud you and thank you both for this wonderful session and the wonderful conclusion to the program.